Okay, so um, my name is uh, Benoit Averti. I work at uh, Zenica, where I do uh, consulting and, and training. Um, I like both uh, front-end and back-end uh, development, but uh, today we're going to talk um, about uh, JavaScript um, and uh, more specifically reactive programming with RxJS. Uh, my goal today is not to make a comprehensive uh, introduction to reactive programming. It's not to uh, show you uh, how to do it from scratch or things like that. Uh, I have two, two goals today. It's, uh, one is to show you that uh, reactive programming it is not just the, the latest uh, buzzword. It's not um, going to disappear as soon as there is uh, something more uh, hype. Um, and the second thing is to, the, the most important one is to show you that uh, there's nothing uh, magical about uh, RxJS. Uh, it's really not that complicated and uh, it's, a, it's a technology I think that is um, quite simple actually uh, if, you, if you don't do a very advanced uh, stuff. But uh, it, there, there, there isn't a lot of uh, really good resources on the internet to really understand uh, what's going on when you use uh, reactive programming. So um, we're going to start with a little bit of uh, theory. Uh, so hopefully it won't get uh, boring. The, the goal is just to show you how um, RxJS fits into the JavaScript, JavaScript uh, landscape. And uh, you, you will see that it's really the logical continuation of the, the evolution of the language. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about basic uh, building blocks of JavaScript applications, uh, starting with the function. And um, what's interesting to me about the functions in, in this talk is the, it's the most basic way um, for a piece of code to get uh, a single value that you don't know in advance. So um, really what I'm inter interested in is, is function and not procedures, which means a function that takes uh, zero or, or more arguments and um, get a value in return. Um, so a function, when you call it, you immediately get a, a value. You can't uh, do anything um, between the time you call a function and the time you get the return value because JavaScript is a single threaded uh, language and uh, it functions with uh, an event loop. And um, the, um, the second thing is that you can get only one value uh, as a return of a, of a function. And uh, the first thing, um, the first um, variant of a function that you can have is the, the plural version, which means you can get uh, several values. And this is the, the iterator. Um, an iterator is much like a, a function. It's almost the same thing, except that you can uh, get several values from uh, an iterator. Uh, you, you have an object, you have a next method on it, and you can call this, this next method uh, several times possibly uh, an infinite number of times, and each time you will get a new value until the iterator notifies you that uh, there are no more values to, to get. And secondly, the, um, the second axis on which you can um, change something from the function is the, this push-pull uh, mode, two different modes. Um, sometimes you will see a spatial and temporal too. And um, the equivalent of a function, uh, but in push mode, is the promise. Uh, the main difference between a function and a promise is that you, um, with the promise, you can get a value uh, at, an, uh, in the, um, at a later time in the, in the future or um, immediately. And the most uh, important thing to note is not uh, the timing of the, the value that you are going to get. It's the, the way that the promise will push you the value uh, when you use it. So the, the real difference between a function and a promise is that um, uh, it's the promise that decides when the value is going to get sent to, your, uh, to, to the code that uses the promise. Um, and really, it's not, the, it's not the timing that is important because a function can, can take a long time to compute uh, the answer, or a promise can be uh, instantaneous. But when you use a promise, you have no way to know when you are, you are going to get uh, the value or if you are going to get a value at all because it can be a, an error or a cancellation. And you probably guessed uh, where I'm going with this because there's a, there's a blank uh, place on this slide and until uh, reactive programming and li libraries like RxJS, this was a missing piece in the, in the JavaScript uh, language. 
And this is the observable that fits here, um, which is the, the core object used in RxJS. And uh, in fact, you can see that it was uh, really a missing piece and that it's a logical continuation because now you have observables in the JavaScript standard. Uh, you, you don't need to use RxJS to use uh, observables. And the observable, uh, as you will see, has both the features of an iterator uh, and the features of a promise. So you use it uh, like this uh, with the subscribe method. If you have uh, one observable, you use the subscribe method. And it works uh, quite like the, the then method of a promise, in which you, you, you pass a callback function as a parameter. And this callback function will be called with um, the, the data that the observable is, is sending you. And uh, this will uh, allow you to make uh, something with this data. You can also use an observable in a more functional style um, by using, for example, the operators filter and uh, map, uh, which, which uh, look like the operators that you use on uh, arrays or iterators in JavaScript. And on this slide, you can see that the observable is both like a promise, uh, because you don't use the return uh, value of the observable, but you use a callback uh, function. And it, it also has the features of an iterator or array, because you use this uh, kind of functional style with the filter and map. So really, if, you, if we summarize uh, what I've just said, the reactive programming, you have events that are propagated by a source, the observable. These events are propaga propagated in push mode, uh, whereas the, uh, in which the, the observable decides when the values are going to arrive. And you, as the developer, as the user of the observable, you only define the reaction, the, the behavior of the, um, that is going to, to happen when data arrive. So this is not complicated. It's just the observer design pattern. Uh, this is something you all uh, studied in, um, in school. Um, but the difference in reactive programming is that we are going to use this design pattern um, as the, an entire programming style. You will uh, make entire applications by using only these design patterns. And this is where uh, libraries like RxJS or others uh, can really bring you a lot, because they, they will allow you to make really complex things with this simple building block uh, that is the observer design pattern. So I'm going to talk about uh, RxJS a bit. RxJS is the most popular library to make uh, reactive programming in JavaScript, I think. Um, if you've seen the, the talk about uh, reactive uh, systems uh, this morning, um, RxJS is in the same uh, category of libraries, uh, which are uh, inspired by the Rx.net um, and has been now ported to lots of languages, um, including C++, for example. But we are only going to talk of JavaScript. So in RxJS, you have observables, of course. And you can, you can create them uh, from several, several ways. The first one is to use the from constructor, for example or the interval constructor. And um, the from constructor will uh, make an observable that emits the values um, immediately upon subscription. So when you subscribe to this first observable, you will get the values 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, immediately. But not as an, an array. Uh, each value will be sep uh, separate and will call the, the observers uh, uh, one time each. The second one is uh, almost the same, except it will, um, it will send you an infinite number of increasing uh, integers with a uh, one second interval. So each second you will get an integer which is uh, growing. These are two ways among others, but the most generic way to create an observable is to use the create constructor. And in this create constructor, you can pass a, a function. And this fun in this function, you will be able to define uh, your own custom event emitting logic uh, so this is with this constructor that you can create uh, any observable that you like. And we're going to talk a bit uh, about this one uh, after. If you have uh, observables, of course, you need observers. So in this slide, let's uh, assume I have an observable that I created, uh, or maybe that someone passed to me. And when I call the subscribe method on this observable, uh, the, par the parameter to the subscribe method, this is the observer. So as you can see, is, um, 
it's only a, a plain old JavaScript object with three callbacks, three members uh, that are callback functions. One of them, the next uh, method, is going to get called when the observer sends some data, when the observable sends some data, sorry. And the error on complete uh, callbacks are called when there is, uh, respectively, an error or the completion notification of the, the observable, when the observable doesn't have any data left to send. Um, earlier in my slides, I, I've made a subscribe call with only one function as a parameter. When you do that, uh, RxJS will just assume it is the next um, callback. So this is a, a variant, but the, the generic way to do that is by uh, bypassing uh, this kind of observer. Of, uh, observer. And finally, uh, and perhaps the most important things uh, in RxJS are operators. Operators are simply uh, functions that will allow you to transform your observables and combine them and manipulate them. And um, so it, it will uh, each time return a new uh, observable and, and don't, uh, it, it won't uh, change the, the original one. And this is uh, what will allow you to make really complex applications and complex behaviors starting from really simple building blocks um, of uh, uh, simple observables. And I'm going to show you uh, some examples to illustrate that. Um, so the first one is the filter operator that you have uh, already seen. Uh, it's probably familiar to you if you are used to make, uh, to, you, to do functional programming or other things like that. And uh, as you can see, the, um, the result observable on the bottom uh, emits the same events as the source observable, but only if they satisfy the predicate that you, give, that you have given the, the, the operator. So you have uh, always on these kind of diagrams, which we call uh, marble diagrams, you have the source observable on the top, the operator uh, in the middle, and the result observable at the bottom. Um, the second one is the map operator, which is, uh, again, exactly the same operator as you can find on iterators or arrays in JavaScript. Um, and it will just uh, pass all the events of the source observable into a simple transforming function, here uh, multiply by 10. And uh, the result observable will emit these events. Um, these two operators that we have just seen, they probably look familiar to you, and that's because they, they don't use uh, the chronological um, feature of the observables. They don't manipulate or use the timing of the events. They just send the events at the, exactly the same time. And th this is why uh, these operators are the same as an arrays, for example. But there are also uh, other operators that uh, will take advantage of this feature of the observables uh, that arrays don't have. And the first one that I want to show you is the merge operator. Uh, in this one, you, you have two observables, and uh, the merge operator will make you an observable that is the, um, the combination of the two that will emit uh, all the events which one or the other source observable uh, will send. And um, here you can already see that this wouldn't make sense on, on arrays. This wouldn't uh, be possible to merge two arrays like this because you wouldn't be able to, to know in which order to send uh, the events. Um, and you would need to provide some other way to order them, for example, a comparison function or something like that. Um, but the merge operator like this with only the two parameters, it doesn't make sense without the notion of time. And you can see here that this event uh, happened between the, the two others because chronologically it happened uh, be between the two. And if it happened just a little bit um, earlier, it would be at a different place in the result observable, even though the, even though the order uh, here didn't change at all. And more than that, you have also uh, operators that uh, will be able to manipulate the, this time and just not just use it. The first one is the delay uh, observable, uh, the delay operator, which is uh, very intuitive. Um, here you can see that the events uh, on the result observable happen after a one second period of time um, per, um, versus the source observable. It, this is just a coincidence if the, the one uh, is here. 
Um, this, for example, makes it very easy to implement uh, features like um, like a cancellation delay, for example, if the, the source observable is the, an action made by the, util by the user, like uh, clicking on a button, and the, the result observable will be used to trigger, for example, a, a network request, uh, you will be able to use the delay op uh, operator and implement a, a delay in which the user will be able to cancel his actions, for example. A uh, little bit more complicated operator, and this is the, the last uh, one that I will show you. Uh, it's the debounce operator. And the debounce um, operator looks a bit like uh, the delay because it's, it's, um, it makes the events on the result observable happen later than the source observable. But here the difference is that um, if you have a lot of, um, of um, events that, are, that happen very close in time, um, only the last one will be emitted. And here you can see um, if this event happened uh, earlier, then it would be emitted because you have the one second uh, period of silence uh, between, between him and the, the next one. But if this next one happened here, then it would be sent. And again, this, this allows you to make a, a very easily uh, behavior that is more complicated without that. It's, for example, um, if you make an auto-completion, uh, a form that can auto-complete, uh, you don't want to, to make too many requests uh, to the server. And especially uh, when the user uh, types lots of, um, of, of keys here, for example, in a very short period of time, it's because he knows what he's typing. So he, he doesn't need uh, the, the auto-completion suggestion. And only when, when you have here a, a period of silence in which the, the user has finished typing, then you can make your request to the server and, uh, and suggest a, a list of, um, of completions with the, the result observable. OK. Um, I won't sh show you all the operators, because there are too many of them. But um, I want to talk ab a bit about uh, some confusing behaviors that can happen when, um, well, th these are all questions that I've asked myself, myself when I discovered the reactive programming. Uh, for example, uh, why isn't my observable doing anything? Uh, I, I, for example, if I wanted to make an HTTP request in an observable, sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, and you will see on the internet sometimes that people say, tell you an observable is lazy and you need to, to activate it somehow. But uh, sometimes the, the, the opposite problem happens too. Uh, HTTP queries, queries are, are uh, executed twice, uh, where uh, only one would suffice. You have also the notion of uh, hot, hot observables versus cold observables. And this is not really easy to understand uh, with based on, the, uh, based on the internet articles. And synchronous or asynchronous nature of observables. Uh, this is not necess necessarily that complicated, but there are um, contradictory informations on the net. Yeah, sometimes you will see that observables are synchronous. Sometimes you will see that they are asynchronous. And it's not that easy to, to know which one is true. So um, whenever I asked myself these questions, I decided to go back to basics and to, um, to create my own observable to uh, really understand what's going on. And uh, this is what I'm going to show you today. Um, so originally, I had a um, plan to do this uh, live coding um, in front of you, but um, I wasn't sure I would be able to speak in English and uh, at the same time uh, do my programming. So what I did is I, um, I recorded myself, and I will just comment uh, the code. Um, so uh, this, this is uh, uh, the, the code that I've done, and I will, I will try to explain it to you. Um, and to do that, maybe I should. Yeah. OK. So as I've said, the goal is to make an observable from scratch. And uh, to prove to you that uh, I'm really starting from scratch and not cheating or something, I'm just starting with a, a blank code and a function. And this function uh, I called observable, but for now it's just a, a plain old function. So I can uh, use it like this by using console.log and passing it the return value of my function. And as you can see on the right, uh, it, uh, it works. I have my console.log inside the function, and I, uh, I get the value that I print in the console. 
The problem here is that uh, I, I can't uh, do the, the two features of the observable. The first one is uh, be able to send two return values. And as you can expect uh, here, it doesn't work because uh, the, the second return is, uh, is dead code. It's not going to get executed. And the second uh, problem is that I, I can't uh, do this in push mode. Uh, if I wanted, for example, use a set timeout to send the value after uh, one second, I'm not able to do that because, um, uh, as I said earlier, uh, JavaScript is a single-threaded uh, programming language. Uh, nothing can happen between the, the start of a function and the return. Um, there is a one simple uh, way and well-known way to solve this in JavaScript. It's, it's to use uh, callback functions. So this is what, I've did, uh, what I, I did. I used a, a callback function, and instead of returning the value, I call the callback uh, with the value. The, the function uh, this way, it's not, it's not used exactly the same, but it's very similar. And here you can see that uh, it works uh, for, for now. It has exactly the, the same behavior. But this time, um, I am able to send two values to the observer, for example, uh, 42 and 43. And uh, I am also able to do this in push mode uh, one second later, for example, in this example. And here, you can see that the value arrived uh, at a later time. And what I have here is, is already almost an observable. Uh, you can see that I have the two features of an, of an observable. And this is really the, the core of the observable. But um, to go a little farther, let's do uh, something a little bit more concrete and uh, call, um, make an HTTP request to a server. So you, uh, the server is on the, the bottom right of the, um, of the screen here. And it will just print um, when it receives a request. And it will um, send the hello world string uh, back to the caller. So here you can see that I've made the network request. And then uh, on the top, you can see that uh, I've printed the result, hello world, uh, in the console. But if, I do, uh, if I'm going to, to start making a network request, uh, I have to handle uh, error cases. Uh, for example, I'm going to simulate uh, a network error by mistyping the address. And here uh, you have the dreaded um, unhandled promise rejection. Uh, which is bad because it's, uh, it's an error and you, you didn't manage it. And um, it's even said that uh, in the future, uh, it will completely terminate the node process. So it's not good, of course. The basic way to handle this um, with the fetch API is to use catch. Of the, uh, this is a promise method. And uh, I can just catch the error and send it to the observer in the same way. So here you, you can see that I've handled my error. I don't have an unhandled promise rejection. But this isn't uh, really um, a good practice because you, uh, I'm handling the error exactly in the same way that I'm handling data. So I, ha I have no way, as the observer, I have no way to know uh, when I receive an error, if it's an error or some data. So um, instead of just calling the observer uh, parameter, I'm using uh, the next and error callbacks. Uh, and instead of passing just a function, I pass the, an object, which begins to look like uh, an observer. And I have, I have two different callbacks. And on these two different callbacks, I am able to have two different behaviors uh, for the error and for the data. I'm just going to OK, and here you can see that my error was, not, was handled uh, as an error and not as, as some more piece of data. While I'm adding um, uh, callbacks, I can also now use the last, the third callback, uh, which is the complete callback. And this callback is going to get um, called when there is no more data to be sent by the observable. And here, uh, th since my observable just does one request to the server, it will just uh, tell the observer that it has finished uh, right after sending the result of the HTTP request. And it works. I get the observable has finished a notification after. Um, what I have here, you have to believe me, uh, it's almost exactly like the observables are in RxJS. Uh, of course, Rx provides uh, other things like uh, error handling and edge case um, 
And, um, but we, we will already be able to answer some of the questions that uh, we've asked ourselves earlier. And the first one, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, I have an observable, but the shape didn't change. It's still just a function. I didn't make a class or anything. I don't have uh, closures and private uh, parameters or something like that. It's still just a function. And if I comment out uh, the call to this function, of course, nothing happens. This is perfectly normal because it's a function. But it's exactly the same thing uh, uh, with an observable. If you don't call, if you don't subscribe to your observable, then nothing happens. It's perfectly normal. So in a sense, yes, observables are lazy, but uh, so are functions. It's a little bit uh, overkill to say that functions are lazy. It's quite obvious that if you don't call uh, the observable, nothing will happen. This is uh, perfectly natural. And um, the same is true if I call my observable two times. Uh, this is perhaps less intuitive, but if I call my observable two times, you can see that I performed the side effects two times, and in particular, my uh, server received two network requests. Again, this is perfectly uh, normal if you remember that observables are just functions. And um, this is probably what happens uh, when you have two networks requests. It's just uh, that you've subscribed to your observable two times. <coughs> If I wanted to avoid that, to avoid uh, making two network requests, what I could do is uh, take this request, this fetch call, and put it outside my observable, and just use uh, the result inside the observable. And if I do that, then this time I had uh, two side effects uh, to the console.log inside my observable happened two times. But on the bottom, you can see uh, my, my uh, server received only one request, which is what I wanted. And what I've made here is just that I've made a, a hot observable. This is the only, the key difference, let's say, between a cold and hot observables. The cold observables are going to, upon subscription, subscription, um, they will create their source of data. For example, here, a network request, but it could be a WebSocket connections or things like that. Uh, they will create this source of data and start emitting events from this source to the observers. On the other hand, uh, a hot observable will use a source of data that is already existing somewhere in the application, and um, they won't create one uh, each, time, uh, each time they are called. And this is really the, the only uh, difference. And the last thing was uh, the synchronous or asynchronous matter. matter. And uh, there is a really easy way to test this, is to make um, console.log before and after calling my observable, and I will be able to see, to see uh, when the FX happens. Is it before or after the second uh, console.log? When I execute it, you can see the order of events. Um, the result, hello world, which is the result of my uh, HTTP request, happened after the second console.log. So it would seem here that, uh, in fact, observables are asynchronous. But in actuality, um, what happens is that my network request, which uses a promise, uh, this is what, uh, what's asynchronous. The promise is asynchronous. And the observable, it's like, the observable itself, again, is, is just a function. So if inside uh, I do something perfectly synchronous, like just calling uh, observer.next, then this time you can see that the 42 happened uh, before the second uh, console.log. So to answer the question, uh, observables, are neither asynchronous nor they are synchronous. They, it just depends on what you do inside. Uh, it, it, again, it, it's just a function, so if you do synchronous stuff inside, the function is going to be synchronous. If you do asynchronous stuff, it's going to get asynchronous. And again, uh, I can't prove it to you uh, like this, but you have to believe me. It's exactly like that in RxJS. You can do the test uh, yourself. If you do an observable in RxJS with only synchronous stuff inside, the observable will be uh, completely synchronous. The subscription will be synchronous. OK, I think this is the end of my video. So a quick summary. Um, why isn't my observable doing anything? Is it because uh, it's lazy? Yes, but so is a function. So it's really just that you need to, to call the observable for anything to happen because it's just a function. Same is true for uh, the uh, HTTP queries that are executed twice. It's probably because you're subscribing twice to the observable. 
And uh, this is why when you go to the internet, they will tell you to, um, to use the share or multicast operators or things like that, which seems quite magical. But in reality, um, what these operators do is just that they, cre they create a, a hot observable from the cold observable. And the, um, this will allow you to share one source of data between all your, uh, all your observers instead of making the, the HTTP queries uh, several times. And finally, uh, synchronous or asynchronous, neither. It's just a function, so it depends on what you do inside. There was last one question, which is uh, how, to, how to know what operator to use. Um, as you can see here on the, this uh, image of the RxJS documentation, there are a lot of operators. So there's no secret. The only way is to go read the docs. And there is a, a wizard that is done that is very, very well done uh, where you can uh, click on um, questions uh, that describe what you want to do, and uh, it will tell you what uh, operator you most likely uh, need to use. Okay, speaking of operators, uh, here I've done, um, yeah. I've uh, made an observable from scratch, but we didn't make operators, and this would then be complete if I didn't talk about operators. So as I've said earlier, an operator is just a function that takes a, an old observable as a parameter and will return a, a new observable. And this new observable is just an observable like any other, so it's a function uh, that takes uh, an observer as a parameter and we will call the values of this observer, the, the callbacks of this observer with some data. So how is this new observable going to get its data? Uh, the data will come simply from a subscription to the old observable. So when you call the new observable, it will uh, subscribe to the old one and pass it an observer. And in this observer, we will, drill, we will just call the callbacks of the new observer. So this is what, what you can see here. When the, um, the old observable sends a complete notification, um, it will call the complete notification of the new observer, which was passed to the new observable. Same for the error. And for the data, this is when we'll be able to implement the behavior of the operator. For example, in this case, um, when the old observable sends some data, which is, for example, a string, uh, this observable will compute the length of the string and send, send this length to the new observer. So this is my operator. Uh, I, I use it by calling it like this with, with an observable as a parameter. And if I do this, then nothing happens, except the console.log uh, that is inside the operator. This is perfectly normal, because what I have did is I, I just uh, made a new observable, but I didn't, I didn't subscribe to it. And if I didn't subscribe to the observable, it's normal that nothing happens, uh, especially um, it didn't subscribe to the old observable. So if I want to use uh, this new observable, I just have to store it in a, in a vari variable and use it exactly the same way as I did earlier by calling it and printing the result in the console. And this works. So what happened here? Um, the observable, the result was called, which is the, the new observable here that I programmed. This new observable uh, subscribed to the old observable which made the network request. Then it sent the value to its own observer, which is the observer uh, that I defined inside the observable, inside the, the new observable that is inside the operator. And this computed the length of the hello world string, which is uh, 12, and sent it to be printed in the console. So if you're not used to, um, to functional programming and higher order functions, this, this may be a little bit more complicated uh, than the simple observable. But it's really not, uh, as you can see, it's still just functions. There's nothing magical uh, in, in this. And you can just spend a little bit of time at home uh, doing that again. And you will see that it's really easy to, make, to, to, make, to get it to work. And here, you will see that um, I wasn't lying when I said this is very close to RxJS. Because what, what I'm going to do is replace some of this code with the code from RxJS. And you, can, you will see that. Uh, nothing much, much uh, will change. Uh, here, instead of um, creating my own function for the observable, I'm using the create um, 
constructor. Uh, I talked about it a little bit uh, at the beginning. Um, I store that in the function, which is exactly the same. I remove my uh, operator because I, I don't need it, because uh, the RxJS provides uh, already uh, lots of operators, and including the map um, operator, which is able to do exactly that, uh, what we've done. And here, instead of just calling uh, my um, observable, uh, I use the subscribe function. And here, you can see that everything uh, happened exactly the same. And uh, this shows you that I've just changed, changed some plumbing, uh, some uh, utility functions, but the, the behavior of my uh, event emitting is the same. And the parameter uh, that I've sent to the subscribe is exactly the same. So in fact, when you use the creates constructor of RxJS, uh, what, you've, what you're giving to, as a parameter is just the subscribe method, almost. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. Now you've probably uh, seen that um, the, the term uh, reactive, uh, functional reactive programming is used uh, quite a lot. And this is because uh, lots of uh, concepts that we have seen uh, here are exactly the same as in uh, functional programming. Uh, first, the immutability of uh, data and of observables. Uh, because you, you don't change observables when you use oper operators, you just uh, create new ones. Uh, pure functions we, without side effects. Operators are pure functions, and uh, the function that you will pass to the operators, uh, it's a good practice to, to make them uh, pure uh, as well. And the notion of pure data flow, uh, because the, the, dat the data will travel in one direction from the source observable through the operators to the observer. And uh, in the opposite uh, direction, you have only the subscription, which will get uh, from uh, the subscribe method to the uh, source observable that you had at the beginning. Uh, and manipulating data is fine, but uh, web development is not only that. You, you will also want to react to click events, for example, to interact with the DOM to make uh, single page applications. You will want to do network requests. And the, the question is, uh, how do I make an application with only functional code? And this is, in fact, a, a question that I've, got, I, I've asked myself uh, the first time I discovered um, functional programming in engineering school, uh, because um, my teacher said to me, uh, you can't make uh, side effects in functions. You can have uh, input-output. And I wondered, how do I perform a network request, for example, if I can't do, net, um, uh, functional, uh, if I can't do side effects in a function? And when I, when I did a little bit of research about that, I, I've seen that uh, you have to use monads. Uh, it was said so on the internet, at least. So I've looked a bit at what is a monad, and uh, I found in particular one article that said uh, monads are the most complicated thing um, in the history of computer science. Mm -hmm. And this was a little bit scary because I, I was young. I just wanted to print something in the console. So, um, of course, this isn't a problem in JavaScript because JavaScript, it's, it's, not, it's not a pure functional language. You can do imperative code in your subscribe method and uh, everything is fine. But still, um, this question exists and this is um, what uh, Cycle.js aims to answer. Uh, for those uh, who don't know, Cycle.js, it's, uh, it's a little bit we uh, less uh, known than uh, RxJS. It's a, um, it's a framework, a tiny framework, that uh, will allow you to make uh, functional and reactive uh, applications. So to do that, Cycle.js will take care of two things. Uh, first, it will create observables as input of the, uh, your application, and these are, are called um, source observables. And Cycle.js will also uh, perform the side effects for you. Uh, it will um, read the observables that you pass at, as a result of the application, the sinks observables, and they will perform side effects, for example, um, network requests, etc. And the application itself, between that, is completely pure, reactive, and functional. Um, it will do that uh, with the help of uh, drivers, and drivers are the, the components that are really responsible to create the source observables from what they call read effects, from example, uh, clicks, HTTP responses, or things like that. And they will, they will uh, produce write effects from sinks observables, which is, uh, for example, DOM structure changes, HTTP requests, and uh, things like that. Um, 
So you can see that's, that on, your, um, on this uh, slide. Uh, on the top, you have your, your application, which is called the main function uh, by convention. Inside, you will only use operators and observables. You will uh, combine them. You will have the, the, this pure data flow um, between all your uh, operators and observables. And at the bottom, you have the drivers, which will uh, perform the side effects and do all this imperative stuff that you can't do in functional uh, programming languages. Um, and Cycle.js, the framework, it will only connect these two things, uh, as you can see on the, on the diagram. And this is what forms the, the cycle between uh, your main function and the, the drivers. And um, you have uh, lots of drivers that allow you to do uh, lots of things. Uh, the most basic one are the DOM drivers and the HTTP drivers. And these will allow you to make, uh, to perform, um, to change the, the structure of your page, to make a HTTP request and react to events. And there are also a lot of community drivers. Uh, for example, you can do WebSockets, you can manipulate uh, React Native or something like that. You can use the notification API of your browser. All, the, all of this um, you will do by passing some special values in your observables, uh, in your sync's observables. <coughs> so I've made a very simple uh, de demo application, uh, which is, uh, as you can see, the most basic one. I have a counter on the right, and I can um, <coughs> change the value of this counter by, uh, with two buttons. Um, here is the code for this. So I have um, this main function here, um, which is the application itself. As you can see, it takes uh, the sources as a parameter. And on the bottom, I have my uh, the, the run method of the cycle.js uh, framework. Excuse me. <coughs> and this run method will, will do the, will create the cycle between the list of drivers that I've provi provided here and the main function. Inside the main function, uh, you will want to do almost the same thing uh, each time. Um, you will first create uh, observables that represent the actions of the user. Then from these action observables, you will uh, be able to compute a state. And uh, the state of the application, again, is just an observable that will emit events whenever the state changes. And from this state, you will be able to construct a virtual DOM tree, or a view, more generally. And this view uh, we, it is uh, what you will send to the drivers and which will be used to render your application. So let's dive in a little bit. Here my actions are the clicks on the buttons um, made by the user. So I take my DOM driver, uh, the source observable that comes from my DOM driver. And this, this is uh, provided by the Cycle.js framework. <clears throat> I select the um, elements in my page that has the increment uh, CSS class. <clears throat> and on this uh, element, I take all the click events, and which is what I have did here. So what I get in this observable <clears throat> are the, the click events uh, as you are used to, um, to get uh, when you perform, for example, a, a hand click and handler. So it's uh, the complete DOM event with a target and value, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just mapping this entire event to just the value one, which is the only thing that, uh, that's interesting to me here, is that when the user clicks on the button, I have a one that is sent in my observable. <coughs> so this could be, for example, this, this diagram. Uh, here the user clicked three times. Then I do the same thing for the decrement actions. Um, the difference here is that I take the decrement CSS class, and instead of mapping to the value one, I map that to the value minus one. And this could give, for example, this, uh, this diagram. <coughs> and then uh, I want only one observable for, for all these actions. So I use the merge operator, and I get this observable here as a result 
uh, which will emit the value one when the user clicked on increment and the value minus one when he clicked on decrement. <coughs> okay, so this is the way I modeled the actions of the user. <coughs> and uh, I modeled it that way because it will make this easy to compute the state of my application. So here on the counter state, um, I take my uh, observable of actions. I uh, use the start with operator, which is very intuitive. It uh, just appends the value uh, zero at the beginning of my observable. And then I use this scan operator. Uh, for those of you who know the functional programming or who do uh, React or Redux, for example, uh, this is much like the reduce function. Uh, except each time uh, a new event arrives, I will compute the intermediate uh, value and send it on the observable. So here you have the, you pass a function to the scan operator, which will take the current uh, value of the observable and the accumulation of all previous values. And it will re return the sum the same of the two. So here, for example, if I have uh, had this observable of actions, then I get zero as a value from the start with. Then I receive the one value here. So I do zero plus one, which is one. Then uh, one plus minus one, this makes zero. Then plus one, I get one, and plus one, I get two. This is like a reduce, function, reduce on the, an array, except each time here you get an event on the source observable, I emit the, the temporary value that is uh, in the observable. And this is exactly the state of the counter that I will want to display. Then when I have so this counter state observable, and I use very simply the map function, the map operator, and I will map this counter state um, to a virtual DOM tree, which I described here uh, by using uh, div, button, and p, like for example, um, this function that are um, provided by CycleJS and which describe a virtual DOM tree with uh, HTML uh, tags. But I could also uh, use uh, JSX, for example, in here, uh, like I do in uh, React. And uh, this observable of uh, virtual DOM uh, trees, I send to my DOM driver. <coughs> Excuse me. And the DOM driver uh, will uh, render your, your application based on this. So here is the is a really nice animation that I found on the internet. Unfortunately, uh, the screen is a little bit too small. So on the left here is the application uh, as you would see it on the screen, as you've seen, uh, in fact, in the previous slide. <coughs> and on the right is a representation of the application with the box uh, being uh, operators. And the observables are kind of the lines uh, that go between them. <coughs> so when I click here, <coughs> on the buttons, I get some events uh, that I are not described. And the events are mapped to values. And then they are merged into actions. These actions are used to compute a state. The state is transformed into HTML tree. And this tree is then uh, sent back to the application. And the DOM drivers will re-render it based on this uh, virtual DOM tree. Of course. Uh, this uses virtual DOM uh, in the background, so it won't uh, render the entire application each time. It will make this uh, very efficient. But the basic idea uh, is the same. <coughs> um, it will um, just um, take observables, very simple observables, as events at the beginning, and combine and transform them into complex uh, things, like complex DOM tree and request and things like that. <coughs> which will be handled um, by the, the observables. So as you can see, um, CycleJS allows you to make uh, applications that are purely functional. And in fact, um, as an experiment, uh, many people, including me, have tried to use a, a, a special configuration of uh, ESLint, uh, a linter, to forbid everything that is not functional in, uh, in JavaScript. So you, can do, you can't do return, you can't do set timeout, you can't do anything uh, that isn't purely functional. And even with this configuration of uh, ESLint, uh, you are still able to, to make um, 
applications with Cycle.js, uh, just with the, exception, with the ex exception of the, the only uh, cycle.run call uh, to launch the application. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.